Okay, uh, so in at Wampanoag, and, um, and you know, my African tribal ancestry was robbed from us a long time ago, so I can't even, I'm gonna talk about tribal identities in an African perspective too. And then, you know, the colonizers got their genes in there too, you know. Scottish and French and possibly others. Okay. All right. That's good Thank enough. You. All right. Thank you for coming. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to see you again. Okay. Well, good to be here. Good to see you. I got a special place in my heart for the Salish and Kootenai people who taught me how to teach. You know, I'd say 33 years ago. Um, a whole new world opened up to me when I moved here and uh, all kinds of connections with my own identity, with the natural world, all kinds of good things. And uh, I imagine some of you folks might even be the children of my students at Two Eagle River School back in the 1980s and uh, early 90s. and. I'm thankful to all of them, even the ones that uh, try to give me a hard time. No, they are joking all the time. I learned the value of joking and all that here, too. Lots of good things. So I'm, uh, like um, Heather was saying, of diverse ancestries, urban-raised, uh, native and African, Wampanoag, Choctaw, African, French, and all the rest. I, and. Uh, did not have the um, privilege, honor, to be raised in the traditional indigenous way. I had to learn later in life on my own. Um, I started teaching when I was 33, 33 years ago, and this is my last semester coming up. I'm going to graduate and just, uh, not graduate, what do they call that? Retire. <laughs> It's kind of the same thing. It's, there's some similarities there. And, uh, now, retire is winding down, but I have all kinds of work I want to do and farm, and I'm in the food sovereignty movement, which I may talk about at the end, because this is going to be connecting a lot of things. And um, you'll see, uh, get a lot of information, um, but it's a lot of what you are going to hear will make you wonder uh, how much BS have I been taught all my life? You know, is there anything trustworthy in the general knowledge and education uh, world, especially about our history, history of indigenous peoples, our identity as we get it filtered back to us from people who have no idea who we really are? teaching uh, American history and Native American studies and all of that. Uh, how much have we taken in that we might want to discard someday and replace with, with good knowledge and, and meaningful knowledge that will guide us forward into a good path? So the first thing I want to talk about is um, the human race's history with indigeneity. And it's everybody's history. We didn't start out being uh, off balance and uh, excessive in consumption and technology and all that. If you take what most scientists say, and the, all of this is up for question, you know. Modern man, as they used to call them, modern humans, post-Neanderthal, about 200,000 years. So and this is a debatable figure. Uh, we could waste time debating that, but let's just say that's pretty generally accepted. And, you know, there's all kinds of debate about how human the Neanderthals were and all of that. Okay. But if it is this, and it could be a lot longer than 200,000, it could be somewhat less. That's... What, what we know as modern uh, 
mega society, unsustainable society, human life, is only 2.5% of our entire human history. In other words, the last 5,000 years is not normal to live in societies that exceed the carrying capacity of your ecosystems, to live in disrespect to our common mother and disjointed and individualistic and not thinking of our connections is only about 2.5% of human history. All humans used to know better, and used to live better. And I would like to suggest that there's no reason why we cannot return to what really matters in connection to life on Earth while we still can, you know. And uh, so with that said, we talk about the indigenous peoples of Africa and America and how they came together. And this whole talk will talk about resistance, as I said in the information I sent to Heather, that these various individuals indigenous tribal peoples of Africa and America had to engage in some sort of resistance just to survive in this colonialist scenario. Okay, and if you can't see all of this, I'm going to just read this before I go to the next slide. So 12,500 years ago is where horticulture, which is natural, uh, cultivation of crops. It's not agriculture, because agriculture is growing crops for something called money. And money doesn't come into the picture until less than 5,000 years ago, maybe 4,500 years. We've been having this artificial uh, imaginary wealth thing called money that's got everybody under its thumb and working for the man and all of that. Okay, and so before people grew crops for money or even for trade or barter, they were growing for their people and just enough to feed everybody in the community. And that was the indigenous cultivation and they supplemented it with gathering the wild foods and they would grow the crops side by side with the wild crops and there was not this idea you exterminate nature to replace it with your cultivated uh, better idea. The, the hubris of colonial society is incredible. They think they've got a better idea than mother nature. Gosh, you know it just boggles the mind when you really think about it. So that's the part you couldn't read. There and any uh, Daniel Quinn fans who think that it all went wrong when we first planted seeds, I'd like to talk to you later. But uh, it was a certain form of cultivation, a disrespectful form of cultivation is where a lot went wrong. But growing crops in harmony with Mother Nature and to fit into an ecosystem that already existed was not harmful, it was sustainable, a supplemental activity, part of our responsibility as humans, as many tribal societies belief systems say, we were here to be caretakers, help take care of life on earth, not to rule over it, but to keep a good thing going, the natural systems. We can improve on these natural systems. Um, we can work with them and supplement them and all of that. So um, real quickly now, um, the, pe the indigenous people who were captured, kidnapped from their homes, from their uh, farms and their communities and their villages and brought to America and forced to become slaves, in a human trafficking system. 
They did not call themselves Africans. Most of them never even heard of that word. Identity concepts. Um, they're from, the people who were captured are from a little area of West Central Africa, uh, extending out to most remotely to about that far. And uh, they didn't represent this entire continent. There are thousands of tribal nations. I've heard estimates between 1,500 and 3,000 tribal nations in Africa, the continent. That's a, a Roman name forced upon people. Uh, this is your continent called Africa. We're, we're going to call you people Africans. You could see it. And so we're going to look at some of the real tribal names now. This map is too uh, hard for you to read from your distance, but uh, I can send you a copy of this. And this is just a sampling of some of the names, uh, Asante, Fulani, um, Igbo. These are real identities, tribal identities, Akan, um, Mende, and um, all of the names you see here. I'm going to show you some more with pictures. Here's the Krobo girls, young women coming of age. And you can see by these photographs, this is still going on. They still have their indigenous coming of age ceremonies in many places. A lot of us, and I know our Wampanoag people don't have that anymore. And uh, m many people don't have the, the young man ceremony, the young woman ceremony. But uh, the indigenous people who survive in Africa today, many of them, the more remote ones, the ones that are messing around trying to join colonialist society and live in the city and all of that, still have it. Okay. All that was stolen from us who now are called African Americans, there are people back there who still have that. And uh, so I'm not going to go on and on about the importance of coming of age ceremonies, but I will say that this was a way that people had their security about their future and their belonging to the community and the community having their back through all the teachings at the coming of age ceremonies. It was one of the most important ceremonies of indigenous people everywhere. That's how you got a good start on the good road besides hearing the stories growing up. And then you enter into adulthood as a story bearer and a teacher yourself. The essential time and, and all of the young people in indigenous societies worldwide who still have this look forward with great joyous expectation to their turn to come into the uh, adult community as they've seen their older cousins and brothers and sisters make that transition. And so that was robbed from many people. Basari, people of uh, western, closer to the coastal West Africa, Senegal. <laughs> really quickly, I know I'm going to be tempted. I have so many slides, I'm going to be tempted to go over time, but I'm not. Okay. <coughs> They, they prove themselves, the young men, about 14, 15 years old, by wrestling this giant. And his name, Odukuta, also called Lukuta. And you can see he comes out into the ceremonial grounds with this gigantic headdress. And they, and they use one of the biggest and strongest men in the tribe, and you can, his head's there, and... And then he takes that off, and he has a smaller headdress, and he starts wrestling with the, the young man. And uh, if the young man gives it all he's got and shows courage and fortitude and a uh, little strength, at, towards the end, the, the giant figure, Lukuta, lets him win. You know? And that's part of the initiation ceremony. Other ones, the Yoruba people of uh, 
Benin and Nigeria. That's another thing about colonialism. They go into some people's homelands and create states and boundaries and nation states. And often the borders go right through a tribe's homeland. So now you're under two jurisdictions, one nation here and one there. Hasn't that not happened all over the U.S.? Uh, Tohono O'odham in Arizona and Mexico, uh, Blackfeet in Canada and the U.S. Because these colonialists just put their borders right through people's homes. And, and so that happened with the Yoruba people over there. This is a honoring the mother ceremony and lots of elaborate effort and time goes into uh, the costumes uh, that represent the different spirit beings and all of that. And um, one of the things you'll see in all of these pictures is that people have a lot of time to put into culture and they're not starving and they don't look sick. Like all of the propaganda you get about Africa, and anytime you see anything on TV about Africa, it's people fighting or starving or sick. That's intentional. It's a long chain of propagandizing for white supremacy. It goes back to the colonial era. It's a habit they have not been able to break because it provides them some kind of sense of security uh, to create this negative images about people of color. And so uh, I just wanted to show you a s similarity in ceremonial uh, outfits and uh, praying, dancing, all of that between uh, certain uh, tribal people in Africa and in America and uh, similar headdresses, designs. Here's the Dogon people. I had a, a good fortune of having a Dogon student uh, from Ghana in one of my classes in the intro to NAS. And throughout the semester, after she got up her courage to come talk to me, you know, she says, you know, what you're talking about, that's the way we believe too. You know, why are we surprised by that? The first ways being in harmony with one Earth and many different ecosystems. And you can see uh, similarities in the Pueblo culture there, similarities in architecture, green architecture, truly green uh, architecture. You know, you don't need a big mansion made out of glass, you know. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Okay. And now they're catching on to this idea of tiny houses. We've been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. And they think, oh, we got something here. They always do that. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, excuse me. I got to put a leash on here and stick to the business. But this, this is a classic style of roof shingles. Uh, the, the old uh, medieval Europeans had uh, grass thatch shingles and uh, islanders, Pacific Islanders, indigenous Americans in the southern plains. Here we the Kansas people who that state of Kansas is named after, sort of. And uh, the framework out of poles and all that. Pueblo, one of the most common green buildings styles throughout the world, adobe, uh, also called cob, mixture of clay, sand, and some uh, fiber, plant fibers, and it's one of the strongest and the best insulation you can find anywhere, and you can build them partially underground or above ground, and, and you're set for winter, summer, cold weather, warm, and there's plenty of room. Uh, some of their, this is Kasena in Ghana, northern Ghana, up a little closer to the Sahara, and uh, painted clay adobe. The step ladder, I should have brought in a copy of the uh, shoe swap in the uh, east of the Cascade Mountains, uh, uh, notched log step ladder 
Same thing over in Ghana. Okay. And uh, people who live in uh, adobe pueblos often like to hang out on their roofs and, and dry their fruit or whatever up there and play games and tell stories. Uh, the old way, that old way of 5,000 plus years ago, uh, the people that are still living that way, that have their land base and their traditions, we finally had some objective anthropologists observe accurately how many hours a week would you have to work to live in the, the old traditional way if you had your land base and everything intact. And uh, uh, there is um, Richard Lee, Marshall Salen, some other uh, anthropologists of the 1960s and early 70s who observed indigenous people of northern Australia away from all of the towns and civilization which are on the three other coasts in Australia and, um, and in some Arctic uh, Inupiat and at the time in the 60s where they were, were still pretty uh, close to the original way and then a few other places uh, isolated Philippine Islands people still live in the traditional way. And, and they calculated that to have everything they needed, food, shelter, all of the basics, they had a 15 to 20 hour average work week. If you average in all of the work done through the whole year, you have your real busy seasons where you're gathering food and drying it and storing it. And then the winters where you're telling stories and joking around and, and uh, having cultural and prayer activities. And you average it all in, 15 to 20 hours a week. What would you do with that? Have everything you need? No need for money? Oh, does that sound impossible? That's a, where are you coming from, dreamland? I heard you grew up in la-la land. Well, I didn't take to it. I left when I was 18, <laughs> crazy city. Okay, well, we're getting rolling here, okay. Adobe's dugout canoes, uh, again in Benin, and I did not find the name of this tribe, but very similar to our Wampanoag uh, dugout canoes, which people have been reviving uh, the, the building of those, and, Oh, the last 20 years or so, they started with the small, more like uh, this size. And now, uh, just in the last couple of years, the big ones that can get a whole bunch of people. And you see the, our, the pictures of us, uh, uh, the different branches of the Wampanoag Nation, uh, Mashpee, Asonit, Aquina, and Poconokit. And there's only about 20 to 30 Poconokit Wampanoags left that I know, you know, they're, they're probably out there, but they don't identify, you know, and uh, we're obviously to different degrees and some not, you know, mixed with African people. There's a lot of history about that, a lot of survival history in the colonial era where, uh, now, you know, they had African slaves in all 13 colonies. Here, I'll put a couple more pictures up while I'm talking. Um, a lot of people don't know this. They always think, oh, slavery, that was a southern thing. No, all up and down the east coast, uh, there is slavery. It just so happens that largely due to the, the moral preaching of Quakers and other anti-slavery activists, the northern colonies, when they became states during the revolution, outlawed slavery. And they were the majority of the population of the new nation of the United States. The Southerners, who had become much more wealthy with their slave owners. And we're only talking about the slave owners in the South always were between 10 to 4 percent, the smaller number as you get closer to the Civil War. And you got some kind of image, probably a lot of you, in your mind, oh, every, everybody in the South, all the white folks were slave owners, you know? But 
there, there was an elite enterprise and everybody else was subject to these lords of the cotton world. You know, not just their slaves, but the entire southern societies and oppressed in many different ways. Okay, I see, I'm, I didn't plan to talk about that. I got to get going. All right, here. So uh, in the poster that you saw, you saw this painting. And uh, be, I want to preface this with, uh, I'm skipping a lot of history. But I'll, what I'm skipping is just that uh, when slavery ended in the North, uh, many of the former slaves, instead of just joining Anglo-American society, went and lived in nations, tribal nations like the Wampanoag and the Pequots and the Narragansetts and uh, the Powhatan Confederacy tribes, Rappahannock and others of uh, Virginia, and all up and down the coast, you know, and down in the southeast uh, during the colonial era. And this is kind of a segue into what I'm going to talk about with the Seminole Nation here is uh, the Muscogean peoples. The Muscogee is the people called the Creeks because the English didn't want to learn how to say Muscogee. You know, oh, the people live by the Creeks. <laughs> What's that all about? Okay. <laughs> but they're very smart. We just don't want to say Muscogee. We want to use the easy word. Okay, they're so smart. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, they would... Their homelands were in northern Georgia and a little ways into Alabama and in central Georgia. And they would uh, bust into the plantations in South Carolina and set people free to rebuild their populations from the diseases that these folks had brought. Uh, the poxes, the measles, the plagues, bubonic plague and all of that was before smallpox became the biggest disease. There were a lot of these foreign viruses that were reducing native populations and beginning on the East Coast. And so part of the strategy, the survival strategy, and as you saw in the uh, images I just showed you of indigenous African tribes, almost instantly the Africans and the natives realized we've got a lot more in common with each other than we do with these forceful colonialist people who are taking over this land, these aggressive, predatory people. And, and, and so it became natural then for when, and when people did escape from slavery to seek refuge in indigenous communities. The Europeans caught on to that real quick and began the age-old process of colonialist aggression and domination called divide and conquer. And one of the manifestations of that was to hire native people to recapture escaped African slaves or to use Africans to help them militarily against native people. Those are a couple of the big ones, and there are other ways. And then they would just tell them terrible, mythical stories about each other, They'd tell the natives horrible things about Africans, tell the Africans horrible things about natives, and try to get them scared of each other. <laughs> that was, that's a, throughout the literature. You can see all these. And of course, cannibalism is one of the big ones they try to use on, for people who really weren't cannibalistic. And, and they perpetuated that myth so much that a lot of people started believing it. Okay, so we come then into the 19th century. One of uh, the forms of resistance, of course, is warfare, you know, and as the European and Euro-American population becomes so large, physical warfare became more and more futile, but it happened. And especially in the early part of that century. The Seminole people who were a, a break away from the Muscogees, and they moved further south into southern Georgia and eventually Florida to get away from not only the English colonialists, but the Spanish who were still present there. And, uh, and many escaped 
the African slaves, mostly from South Carolina and Georgia, joined him. You're going to hear all kinds of disputed numbers, partly from Seminoles who've been conditioned and trained to be ashamed of the African ancestry and connections. There's plenty of them, both in Georgia and Florida, but others that, that don't have that baggage, too. You know, I don't want to paint them all with a broad stroke, but I've run into all kinds. And, uh, but a considerable, because it's in all of the uh, war records, they, they had Negroes is one of the politer words they used, fighting with the Indians against us. We couldn't stop them. There were three Seminole uh, wars against the U.S. To, uh, by this time to stay in their Florida homelands. Uh, the, the second one that I'm going to talk about here was uh, after the Indian Removal Act, the forced exile of 1830. And so in the late 1830s, uh, the Seminoles of Florida were fighting to stay in what was left of their homelands there in Florida. Some of them were captured and sent to Oklahoma. That's why you have Oklahoma Seminoles and Florida Seminoles. I bet you already know all that. Okay. I'm just making sure. Checking in there. <laughs> just checking in. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, um, and the army uh, defeated the U.S. because most of them did not get captured and they stayed in their lands and that's where their reservations or their remnant community reservations are to this day where they insisted on staying put. And um, the stories of uh, African and uh, Seminole and then mixed Afro-Seminole allies are many. This is one of the leading uh, African Seminoles. Now you'll also hear some Seminoles say, well, we always kept separate. We lived together in the same community and we always kept separate. Didn't intermarry and all of that stuff. Baggage, you know. And, uh, but they did, and I'll show you some photos, you know. And, and the United States had such a hard time trying to defeat the Seminole nation in the Second War. They spent $20 million, which is um, a lot more they spent for that bogus Louisiana purchase. You know all about that. They, they put some marks on the piece of paper and say, now we all own the whole American Plains. You know, that one was $15 million, and they, they spent $20 million on soldiers and ammunition and whatnot, just trying to defeat the... <laughs> Seminole Nation of a few thousand warriors, you know. That's something. That's something to uh, remember and be proud of, you know. Uh, then there is the third Seminole War. They tried again to relocate people to Indian Territory, Oklahoma, in the 1850s, about 20 years after the Second War. And this guy, Alligator Chief, or... Alpuda Miko, also called Billy Bowlegs, uh, was a, a warrior in the Second War and the Third. He was the war chief then. And, and again, they were not captured. They were not sent to Indian Territory and stayed. And that was the last time. <laughs> After that, the U.S. said, OK, let them stay in the Everglades. We don't want to mess with those alligators anyway. <laughs> and then much later, the Seminoles are wrestling alligators for tourist money and stuff like that. Okay, there you go. I, I could say more. And there's uh, his uh, grandson when he was young and when he was old and some other Seminoles. And I don't, you know, not in this lecture anyway. I'm not going to talk about who's mixed African and who isn't. I'll let the images speak for themselves because there are people, you know, in some of these families that, deny they have African ancestry because someone taught them in a brainwashing system to be ashamed of that, you know. American Afrophobia is a powerful force and color phobia of all sorts. And, but there you go. And uh, the neck beads, I was going to talk about 
an old uh, Seminole tradition. And I don't say they got that from Africa. This is a uh, spontaneous, there, there are indigenous people around the world, China, India, uh, South America, North America, and indigenous Africa who have uh, elaborate uh, kind of a network of beads going up their necks like that. But I just thought it was an interesting similarity. And uh, now the Maasai and Turkana people of Kenya, they were not among the people captured and brought to America. They were over in the east part of Africa. So there would have been no way for them to come over and influence the Seminole woman to put beads on their neck. That was an independent cultural practice. Now, Mumuila tribe of Angola, that's the in the farthest southern part of the captured African people's territory. And they mostly went to Brazil in the, the biggest slave market in the Americas. But some of them might have, you know, spread. And the trade went all across the Western Hemisphere. You might have been captured and brought to Brazil, and you could still end up in the Caribbean or in North America eventually because of the trade extensions of the slave trade. So you, you see a possible connection there. Next uh, intersection of activism, the abolitionist movement. How am I doing on time, somebody? I, what time is it? 11.10. You can, you can go longer if you need to. Well, no, I don't want to. You can if you want to. OK. I, Okay, don't let me play too much, because I will play. Okay, I'm going to get reined in here pretty soon. Okay, Frederick Douglass, who also happens to be of mixed Native and African ancestry, famous abolitionist, uh, among the many abolitionists who spoke out against the Indian removal policy, you could see it in the abolitionist newspapers. He was also one of the earliest uh, uh, male feminists, you know, uh, of the supporting women's rights and all that, but also native rights to stay in their homelands and not be forcibly removed <laughs> to uh, Indian territory. Uh, here's another guy, maybe even more so, but not as well known as Frederick Douglass. And, and a lot of people haven't been taught anything about it, the anti-slavery movement in America's schools. All they tell you is, and this happened right before the Civil War. Okay, now let's talk about the Civil War. <laughs> you know, and they skipped abolitionism because that was one of the most powerful resistance movements in American history. It lasted much longer than the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s. It had much more breadth and a uh, intergroup alliances. It was a very powerful time of alternative thinking, breaking down all kinds of boundaries and barriers beyond just anti-slavery. You know, the women's rights movement being a big one, but also communal movements, economic movements, all kinds of things. That's what I, I'm about to teach this last semester in my career. So William Nell, and I don't know if he was part native. He's definitely a mixed African New Englander from Massachusetts. But he was uh, the uh, press man for the biggest uh, abolitionist newspaper, William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator, the Liberator magazine. He started working for Garrison when he was 16 years old and continued throughout the movement and until the until he died. No, he died after the Civil War, that's right. So through the whole movement in slavery. And this is just one example of an article in that anti-slavery newspaper. And you can uh, survey all of them and find throughout the 1830s and 40s um, anti-Indian removal articles. Why? What did the abolitionists care about the natives? Well, some of them were humanitarian, of course. They're, human rights activists, but they also saw that the reason that the removal policy 
focused on the tribes of the south because yeah. that was the best place to grow the most profitable crop, agricultural crop, in America at that time, cotton. It was eight times more profitable than the number two crop. It was uh, the most, uh, okay, by the time that the Civil War breaks out, it's like over 50%, 58% of the export revenue in America was from cotton and uh, cotton products, textiles and all of that. It was the big money maker of the whole pre-Civil War era beginning around 1820. That was why they wanted to push the Cherokees and the Muscogees and all the other, the Choctaws and other nations out of the South. They weren't really, the Removal Act wasn't focused on people like the Asonet Wampanoags who only had about a quarter acre of land left, you know, and the landless tribes of the East. They were trying to get to the place where you could grow more cotton and the abolitionists saw that this would expand slavery. It would make slavery almost unbreakable if they took the whole deep south. They don't teach that, you know. Even in NAS programs, you know, I talk to other people who just miss that whole point when they're talking about the uh, Indian Removal Act. It's connected to the larger economic interest Follow the money, people. That's how you find out what the motivations are behind all this stuff. Okay, I got a lot to talk about. I was going to be fast. I want to get to the 1960s, by golly. I want to get to the present. Okay, uh, Pequot guy, also an abolitionist, William Apis. He left the Pequot Nation and went to live with the Mashpee Wampanoags. He wrote articles like this one for the Liberator newspaper, other abolitionists. The next step, uh, removal, Trail of Tears. This famous photograph, uh, this famous painting shows uh, some of the Afro-Cherokee members. And it wasn't just the Africans who were slaves of some Cherokees. They had free people of African and mixed African-Cherokee ancestry in their tribe. There's all kinds of them over in Oklahoma that try to deny that. But here's this painting from that era. There's a African, doesn't look like a slave. He's got his own horse there riding along with him. And there's another one uh, driving a uh, covered wagon. So the Trail of Tears, there's a, well, the other thing is I tell everybody, it's not just one Trail of Tears. You have 67 tribal nations, both, uh, east and west of the Mississippi, forcibly exiled to what we now call Oklahoma. Is that, doesn't that mean there's like 67 trails of tears? I get so ticked off when I hear, the Cherokees are the only ones crying. <laughs> okay, enough of that. I didn't, mean to, I didn't mean to beat on that issue too much. Okay, so before we go to this, modern era in the 60s and all that. What happened in the interim between the, the removal of the Civil War and all of that is the growing academic field called anthropology post-Civil War on into even uh, the 1960s, they were pretty much the academic voice of white supremacy. And one of their biggest doctrines that they attempted to push is that all inferior primitive people, I hate to use this language, but this is what they printed in their textbooks, and they're all going to become extinct. And uh, these are the values that all of the American school system was teaching, is uh, the, the, the values of aggressive, capitalism, you know, uh, predatory consumption, overproduction, all of that, or the values we want to encourage, the values of uh, uh, indigenous people who live in harmony with the earth, not trying to control the earth, was what they were trying to discourage. At the same time this happens in academia, 
the boarding schools were created beginning in uh, 1879. And um, what are they teaching indigenous children? Your tribal cultural values are inferior. They won't make you a good capitalist. You'll never learn the value of a dollar. Join our way of seeing the world. The earth isn't your mother. It's just a thing that you can prod and probe and use and abuse any way you see fit. And this was part of the whole regimen of American education curriculum. And it wasn't just being taught to people of color, it's taught to everybody. And that's why we have a lot of these set notions. Uh, more is better than less. All of that faster is better than slow. All of those things that weren't part of our indigenous worldview and were brainwashed. I include myself. I grew up in that world. And I've been fighting the brainwashing uh, ever since I realized I was brainwashed. <laughs> I think when I was about uh, 15 years old, it started to kick in because I was hanging out with the hippies. That's why. Dang it. Now I'm just telling you. What happened to George? Okay. One of the big uh, kind of um, culminating events of uh, white supremacist anthropology, 1904, St. Louis World's Fair, officially titled the Louisiana Purchase Exposition because it is 100 years from uh, the Louisiana Purchase and from Lewis and Clark coming out and saying, yeah, we're, we're going to own all this. <laughs> you people of the plains, you got to get used to us or leave or whatever, you know. And, and so they got indigenous people from all over the world. I don't know how they brought or coerced people uh, from all over the world. Uh, Philippine Islands, uh, the Ngoro people of uh, one of the many Philippine Islands of indigenous people, they had Chinese uh, of China, indigenous people, they had African indigenous people, and many US American and South American. And they put them on display. Come folks, take your last look at these people before they become extinct. And they also had pavilions at the fair for the boarding school kids from America showing this is the only way to save them indoctrinate them into our ways, teach them how to use our machines and our cultural values and all of that. That was all part of this World's Fair, 1904. Okay, I, I like this guy. I don't know why <laughs> he's saying something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, okay. Now we're gonna move into the 60s. I got a little word here from Jack Forbes, co-founder, one of the, if not the first Native American studies program in the country at uh, UC Davis in 67. Jack Forbes, uh, Lenape, Rappahannock. And he imagined he also probably had some African ancestry like so many of the Virginia tribes and the people of that area. And there, if you can't read this, what it says is, if we have African blood, we should be proud of it. It is good, honest, tribal ancestry. Jack D. Forbes, and he's also the author of one of my favorite books called uh, Columbus and Other Cannibals. Highly recommend it to you. Uh, and uh, the only thing is there's no African tribe, no tribe called the Africans. But you know what he means. You know what he means here. Okay. When I was uh, getting the slides for this one, the Lumbee Nation of North Carolina, who drove the KKK out of their homelands in uh, 1958, I looked at the date. Look at that date. Sound familiar? That's today. <laughs> today is the 60th anniversary of this incident I'm about to tell you about. I had no idea when I was planning all this, that it, we're coming on this anniversary. But the, the Lumbee Nation is, population-wise, the largest tribe 
of the eastern United States, uh, third largest tribe in the whole country, over 60,000 people, but they're not federally recognized. A big part of the reason of that is because a lot of Western tribes, whenever they come up for rep recognition, they'll go lobby Congress against it because the Lumbees will take too big a piece of the pie of federal dependency on the, the BIA dollars and all that. And so they don't care. They know who they are. And uh, federal recognition would be nice, but they're just going to keep being who they are. Anyway, and so January 18th, 1958, the KKK in North Carolina is planning a big rally. And uh, the Lumbees went to the location of the rally grounds, were there before they arrived. And when those Klansmen started getting out of their pickups and whatever, they come out with rifles and sticks, even before they can get their hoods on, you know. <laughs> I was looking at the guy, that's the Klansman. Oh, he, he didn't even get a chance to put his uniform on. And they're out there uh, with guns and clubs saying, get the hell out of our country. Now, they didn't have a reservation. They didn't have the United States permission to call their North, uh, Eastern North Carolina homeland, uh, their country. They just said, this is our country. Get the hell out. And I guess some shots were fired. Some people were injured. No Klansmen pressed any charges against these guys. And you can see they captured the KKK flag banner. And awesome. And that was 1958. As, as the civil rights movements beginning to pick up speed. 1968, I don't know much about this photo. I think it's in Alabama or Mississippi, but I know that's, that guy's not a Mardi Gras Indian. You know? So <laughs> rest assured, I'm not sure what tribe he is. I have to look it up. I don't even remember where I got this photo, but this is just part of that intersection that we're looking at. I want to get into something a little more vital uh, at the same time. These guys and these guys. And what did they have in common and, and in what ways were they allies? The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. You don't usually hear their whole name. You usually just hear the Black Panthers. Ooh, scary, scary. They're black and they got claws or something like that. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was part of a larger movement after the civil rights law was passed. And uh, there is still many people in that movement working towards integration and equality in American society. The people that were also called Black Nationalist, Black Panther Party, were saying, well, how much do you want to join those people, <laughs> you know, and you want to just grow up to be just like them or, or, or you know, what's this goal of equality? Th that's a good goal as far as uh, avoiding discrimination, being able to live at peace and all of that. But is the end result to just become another corporate CEO predator and create more of the stuff that's destroying our planet? Is that the goal of equality? And, and people started to say that. Do we want to take on their cultural uh, affectations and walk like and talk like them, uh, dance to their music, <laughs> all of that stuff, you know? These guys weren't really to get ready to get into country music or anything like that, you know. <laughs> they, they didn't see uh, assimilation, uh, conformity to the Euro-based mainstream as a legitimate goal. And that's what gets lost in all of the reporting on the Black Panthers. And uh, indigenous activists that was part of the fabric of their consciousness. You know, our goal isn't to become just like the colonialist. We want to remain tribal nations uh, to whatever extent we can have true sovereignty under this present circumstance and all of that. 
and keep our traditions and our cultures and our ways of life. You know, now for the Africans, a lot that had been washed away hundreds of years ago, and they were struggling to create some kind of authentic identity. That's what the Black Panthers are really trying to do. Um, not really knowing where to turn to, and I'll just tell you one little funny thing is that the the idea that uh, the language of East Africa. And I lost it again. I was afraid I'd lose that name. Uh, anyway, okay. Okay, I, I thought that might happen because I, I had to look it up when I was getting ready. And Well, the, the language of the people of Kenya and Mauritania in that area is a big language group. Anyway, they thought, well, so that was the only African language they'd ever heard of. So that's the black man's true language, you know, and they didn't know about all of their tribal identities of West Central Africa and all the many different uh, languages there. But they were grasping for something, something other than simply integrating and conforming to uh, white Euro norms. And, and that was what was going on. And, and we see the same thing. And these folks were in conversation with each other, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, a lot of interaction uh, between uh, Amesters and Black Panthers and other hipsters. I, I was a teenager then and hung out with everybody and before I left California when I was 18. And, Okay, a little bit more, you know. How am I doing? I'm way out of line, out of time, or something like that. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Okay, I want to take questions, too. So this is going to be like a super fast uh, uh, slideshow thing going on here. But th these folks were gathered in D.C. after the longest walk. A lot of celebrities here, you see. Only one woman, a native woman, Buffy St. Marie. There's Muhammad Ali. Dick Gregory just died. Here is a super radical guy that a lot of people don't know about. Look him up. Richie Havens died a couple of years ago. Floyd Westerman a few years ago, I guess. And uh, Marlon Brando's dead now. Stevie Wonder is still alive. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Buffy's still alive. She lives in Hawaii. What's her name? Buffy St. Marie, a Cree woman from Canada, a great folk singer. She was in the New York uh, folk music scene, but stayed connected to her cultural roots. And one of the few people to sing on, on Native issues in the 60s. Yeah, wonderful person. Okay. Hey, there's the Charcusta. Had to put that in there. <laughs> because, uh, so bringing it to the present and, and to um, our issues now, Earth First, you know, that uh, social change reform usually is a gradual process, a l slow evolutionary process to correct wrongs, and that's understandable. And, and it makes a lot of sense. If things were still normal, we're in an emergency situation now. The, the proper channels, as they say, you know, work through the government that's consciously trying to, to exploit every last part of the earth they can without regard to who lives or who, li who dies. You're going to work through those channels. So it's time to, to create alternative communities. And that's part of what the I Don't Know More movement and, and the anti-Tarsan uh, demonstrations and the anti-pipeline is all about. And, and Standing Rock was a big manifestation of this. It was more than just a, a protest site. It was an alternative community. And some people didn't plan on it ever ending, you know. And uh, last point, because I'm out of time. 
um, I got a couple more slides I got to show. But anyway, uh, what we're saying, so many of us are saying, and, and we're uh, working towards, and it's not going to happen as fast as you want it to, of course, but hopefully fast enough so that the Earth systems don't just completely collapse is uh, create sustainable alternative communities and economics, boycott the larger system, have true sovereignty. I'm saying this all real fast, a lot faster than I was going to say it, but this is what a lot of us are working towards. Uh, some of us are saying, starve the black snake. Create, uh, the black snake, snake being the oil pipelines, create alternative energy forms. It's going to take a lot of discussion about what can you give up and what must be continued. And uh, indigenous people are at the forefront of this movement for the Earth internationally, worldwide. Climate March, Indigenous Peoples Climate March 2014 in New York, 2015 in France. And I don't, you can't see this photo too well, but in there are some uh, Brazilian. Uh, Amazon people who are fighting their own battles, and some of them, they even brought one of the ancient canoes uh, across to France, and, and uh, they're fighting to, to save one of the, the biggest uh, natural resources and carbon sinks of the world, uh, the Amazon forest. And, uh, and so they're blockading roads, just like we were blockading uh, tar sands equipment on those mega loads in Missoula and they're doing it up in their homeland. So, and many of the tribes of South America, I just thought I'd point out real quick, are mixed Afro-Native people too. I don't, you know, you, you can see it. I'm not gonna walk up to somebody and tell them they're, oh, you're part African like me too, huh? You know, I don't do that anymore. It's, <laughs> people get upset sometimes when you do that. They don't all think like Jack Forbes, you know. Last image. Okay, good place to end. I got a couple more. The original uh, 1960, February 1st, 1960, uh, sit-in protesters at the Woolworth lunch counter in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. If you study the civil rights movement, that's like one of the landmarks right there because all kinds of youth sit in protest happened after these guys. These four college freshmen, one wasn't even 18 yet. This guy, when, you, he, what a difference. Suit, tie, nice hat, when he's a 17 year old civil rights protester and then he kind of dreadlocked out in the <laughs> 60s and he had dreads going down to his ankles almost. Anyway, he married my cousin, the Wampanoag woman, and uh, Lorraine. And there's Barb and our grandkids. And I found this photo just yesterday, Barb. I think he cut his dreadlocks. Unless he's got them hiding. When you see how he rolls them up uh, on the top of his head, he might be hiding under that hat. But <laughs> Jabril Kazan, if you ever get to New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, part of the map, this one at Wampanoag Homeland, uh, what a amazing character. He's had a heart for uh, the love of humanity all of his life. He'll st he has no sense of time, which I'm trying to learn, you know. Uh, but he he'll stop anywhere on his way to any kind of meeting. He's always late because he stops to talk to people. And he cares about each person he stops to talk to. Well, I just thought I'd show you that. Uh, okay. I have to stop sometime. <laughs> There's another cousin who teaches the Wampanoag language. Okay, I'm going to take questions for as long as you can stay. I realize a lot of you have classes to go to and <laughs> schedules. Don't feel bad if you have to leave. Yes. Oh, what's your name? My name's George, George, George Price. George Price? Yeah. Oh, okay. What's your name? Oh, did I meet you before? I've heard your name before. Uh, well, I used to work with the, the movement in yeah. Uh, Oakland. Yeah. And uh, attended by Violet P. Newton. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it kind of brings back memories. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe we can talk after we're done here. We'll have some snacks. Yes, Alyssa. How are you doing? Good to see you. Go ahead. Uh, there's all kinds of junk on the internet, and I did maybe come across some. There's a guy on the internet that says Africans were the first Americans. Yeah, Is it the same guy? Yeah, it was the same yeah okay. Well, you, that's part of it, probably, but you know, you also have people who just have egos. And, and they want to come out and pretend like they know something, you know. And I only have so much time. I can't argue with every whack job I see on the Internet. <laughs> I hate to call people names like that, but I mean some of them are, you know. And Yeah. What's that one? A lot of them are. Yeah, you know, and a lot of that's driven by ego and the star right. mentality of American culture. Everybody wants to be a star or something. Yeah, okay. Any uh, other questions come up for anybody? Uh, things you're wondering about? Yes, David. Question. Yeah. How active is the Black Panther Party in Oakland nowadays? Uh, I, I think they may be non existent. Um, I, I don't know. There might be a revived uh, new Black Panther Party. Seems like I heard something like that. There are programs for uh, feeding neighborhood kids and all that were pretty much taken over by other uh, organizations, local organizations, and uh, I don't know if they're doing anything anymore. Yeah. But I haven't lived in California since 1970. Yeah. yeah. And I just barely keep in touch with people. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Oh, yeah, one more. Okay, we got time for one more. Yes. Okay. So yeah. your professional opinion, it would be better for us as a society to move back to a new, more free, sovereign nation where we can like, grow more of our own food? Yes, and I say not only for indigenous yeah. tribal nations, but local communities. There's this larger grow local uh, recycle, reuse movement that can uh, bring the destructive system down, uh, that can create the potential for a uh, worldwide boycott. It'd have to be international, yeah. but it has to start locally. And it'll involve lots of discussions, lots of modeling, because people don't just accept you by your words, they want to see these types of societies that, that we're talking about. We have to create the models, and there are people working on that uh, now, indigenous people, non-indigenous people. Uh, you can contact me um, on the internet. I've got a blog called Learning Earthways, and uh, I'm also on that Facebook, but I'm trying to stay away from that a little more. <laughs> it's a time suck. I've got to ignore it sometimes. Anyway, but anyway, things are going on in Missoula. Up here, we've got the Food Sovereignty Program going out of our Lee. Patrick's got one right here at, on this campus. Tell everybody what you're doing, Patrick. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> But something's going on, right? Uh, and I care a lot about food sovereignty and um, trying to influence tribes to invest in themselves and their own infrastructure. 
to be able to own their own food systems, to be able to supply enough food for tribal members. Um, this area, um, as we all know, has a lot of natural resources. So being able to <coughs> utilize these resources in a sustainable, indigenous, um, sovereign uh, way is uh, my goal. And I wrote a business plan and um, it involves um, you know, professional, educated individuals um, like George to be able to come teach um, this stuff to a growing population of people who are interested in it. Yeah, but it's for everybody, you know. Thanks, Patrick. That's awesome. And and so there are other folks working on this. Your councilwoman, Shelly Fiant, is one of the leaders. And it's more than just the food. It's taking charge of our own health. Don't depend on this Western medicine pill-pushing radiation spread in uh, industry that calls itself a health industry. I'm sorry, folks. Some people have been healed of that by those things. But the net effect of it all, getting people hooked on uh, pharmaceuticals and instead of tackling the root of cancer, uh, these toxic chemicals everywhere, they'll just put some radiation and more chemicals on you to extend your misery. That's what they did. They gave my mom nine more years that weren't very good years, you know, before she died of cancer, you know. And I'm just, I'm talking too much. Yes, I am. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I, I every now and then I will watch that stuff, mm -hmm. and I'd say fifty to seventy percent of the advertisement is pharmaceutical co products with more disclaimer in the ad than actual good information about their products. Oh, they're saying watch out for this danger and that one, and you know because we don't want to get sued. Is that life? People, please don't yield to this stuff. We have a choice.